Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm always delighted to see the people that come out on these cold February nights to spend some time with us. Our topic tonight will be drones. Love them or hate them, they are the future. Drones are also known as UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, and also UAS, unmanned aerial systems. I tend to use all the terms synonymously. If it's in the air and doesn't have a pilot, it's a drone. If you go back 15 years, you could probably have counted the different types of drones on your hands. Now, logarithmic growth has occurred over the last decade. For instance, last year, 2017, the United States Department of Defense bought 31 different types of drones. There's even a study center in the States now at Bard College to study drones. It's titled the Center for the Study of Drones. And they've got two, uh, two facilities. One is in New York and one is in Washington. Even the fighter jet I routinely fly was converted into a drone by the Iraqi Air Force. Yes, Saddam Hussein successfully transformed the L-29 into a weapon of mass destruction <laughs> in the, uh, the first Iraqi war. Now, I'd like to play the devil's advocate for, for just a second here. Uh, this explosion in both numbers and interest in drones has not been without growing pains. In 2016, Transport Canada reported 148 drone airplane incidents in Canada. One of Transport Canada's most critical regulatory issues today is the establishment of comprehensive regulations for the use of drones. Our speaker tonight is going to tell us about the challenges that are faced to create the right environment to assure economic growth, bring in new technologies, and commercial development in the drone industry, while lower, lowering the risk to the public. Mark. Aruja is the chairman of Unmanned Systems of Canada. One of USC's main foci is on commercial opportunities in virtually every sector you can think of, from agriculture to zoning, anywhere you can use a, zone, or a, a drone from A to Z. They're there. Mark is a graduate of RMC and the Canadian Forces School of Aerospace Studies. Among other career achievements, he was the first commandant of the Canadian Forces Experimental Center where the military did all the initial and uh, comprehensive drone trials. After 32 years, Mark left the Canadian Forces to work for Thales Group before coming to USC. After five years as a director, in November 2015, Mark became the chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mark. This microphone work now? Great. Um, so what, what a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, and um, so uh, a few months ago, I got a call from someone who said, I'm writing a book about things that happened in the period uh, which included just the end of the Cold War. And he said, I need a few pages from you uh, dealing with some things I was involved in. And I got that done the other day, but I realized that my diary of the time was missing. And so it has occurred to me that historians are really those who prey upon the shortcomings, those who were there in the day, who forgot to write down exactly what was going on, and they're recreated many years later, and gosh knows what's right or otherwise, or fact or fiction. So um, <clears throat> you, many of you here have, uh, well, all of you here collectively have a huge, a great appreciation for aviation history, and so I don't intend to go back to the days of Montgolfier or the V-1 or the V-2 or cruise missiles and all of that which might constitute pieces of unmanned aerial vehicle history. So I'm going to start off with a couple of anecdotes about uh, what has happened in Canada in the past. And I'm going to then talk about what is happening today. And it's probably the most dramatic revolution in aeronautics and aviation, everything happening today 
that you might imagine. And this conversation wouldn't even have happened five years ago. So I talked about one of the very, very dynamic um, kind of technology sectors and what's happening in Canada today. And I don't have the greatest pictures. I probably should have spent some more time getting some eye candy. But with this great chart here, maybe the shortcomings, my pictures will be all the more evident. So why don't we head on, Justin, take a bit of a tour uh, on what's going to be a bit of a ramble here. Um, just hoping you're going to give me appreciation for the aviation world we even knew 10 years ago is changing dramatically. And what it's going to be in another 10 to 20 years is going to be unrecognizable for many who are in the industry today. So I, just briefly, we're a national not-for-profit organization. Been around 16 years, and we represent the industry, if you will. Um, just to go back to Bernie's opening remarks, we initiated, we actually co-chair the industry side of the regulatory working group. So point your fingers at us when it comes to regulations. Uh, but the reality is, is a lot of the stuff that has got a Transport Canada stamp on it was written by people in the association out in industry, because that's where the expertise is. It actually doesn't rely on Transport Canada. And in fact, one of your members here got a lot to do with that is Wayne Crow, who just by happenstance happened to be here, former executive director of the organization, and was heavily involved uh, in the regulatory working group, uh, and in fact co-chaired uh, what's called the UAV Program Design Working Group. So uh, we do a whole bunch of other stuff. We run the only national conference on the subject. We have a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and I'm in a retired guy. I do this uh, pro bono. Um, and I spend most of my day connecting dots between uh, a really, really innovative uh, ecosystem that's changing on a daily basis. Um, I don't know what the protocol here is. If you want to put your hand up and ask a question before I get off on some uh, rabbit track uh, that, that you're uncomfortable with, put your hand up and I'm uh, ready to entertain just any question that comes up. Whether I have an answer, of course, is going to be quite different. Um, so let me just put this to you. Um, all of you are from some thing to do with Mandy Aviation. So we had Orville and Wilbur, and we had, you know, uh, all the folks out in Bedeck with Alexander Graham Bell, the Silver Dart. We had a First World War, and 15 years later, we actually had commercial aviation. We had businesses running, using airplanes to make money. And they moved people and cargo. It was in the business of transportation, and today this industry is regulated by the Department of Transport. And we started to get military application of this stuff, but we had no commercial application for 75 years. Nothing happened on the commercial side until what's happening today. In Canada today, last year we estimate the industry had revenues over a billion dollars. First year of kind of revenue generation, and we expect that to go to five billion within five years. But it's got nothing to do with transportation. Nobody's transporting things or people, although I'll put you a teaser out there what's happening most recently, but it's all to do with everything else but transportation. And that's the dramatic change. It's about delivering data. It's not about people, it's not about cargo, it's delivering data. And this is a completely different world we're in today but who are the customers for that data, and why do they want this aviation or aerospace technology to provide that data to them? What's, what's happening here? So we're going to walk our way through a bit of that about what is this revolution and why is it happening. So at the bottom of things, you may have heard this thing called the Internet of Things, where everything is connected on the Internet. And that's what we're seeing here. We're saying that this is just a device that runs on a network and is starting to connect a great host of things that interact together. And UAVs, or drones, are one of those pieces that are making those connections happen. And this is where the telecommunications industry sees its future. And I'm going to talk a bit about the players that are in today's emerging drone world, aviation world, that you've never seen before in this business, and they're going to dwarf the market. So, 
This is Internet of Things connecting all kinds of dots uh, with data generated by these devices. So, so this is kind of the promise. I can get information to you cheaper. Now, some of you may have a military background. You've heard that the military says drones or UAVs are something we like because they do the dull, dirty, dangerous stuff. True. But in the commercial world, that doesn't mean a hill of beans. It's irrelevant. Don't want anybody to tell you dull, dirty, dangerous gets accountants interested. They're interested in only one thing. It's cheaper. It's cheaper. So if you go to an investor and say, I've got a drone and I can do this at half the cost of the way things are currently done, they're not interested. You get just shown the door. Thank you very much. But if you go in there and say, I can do it at a tenth of the cost, you probably will get at least one interview. And that's where the world is now. Dramatic disruption in the way business is done using this technology that, that um, all of you have seen pictures of. So I've got a little question. How many of you here own a, like a, an Inspire or a Mavic Pro or something like that? All right, yeah. So you fly for fun or you actually do some business with it? Mostly. Yeah, okay. So what we like to do, you don't go and poke around your neighbor's backyards or? No, sometimes historic sites. Right, yeah. I did a family farm in Canada for a couple of years and they had a couple of drones out in the area and stuff like that. Right, yeah. Cool. So there's two parts to this. I represent the commercial user. But there's a whole recreational user community that is just blossoming out there. And it's different from the model aircraft clubs in the sense that it's really harnessing a whole generation of youth who love to tinker with software. So I was over at uh, a flight school the other day, and I was talking to their senior instructor. And they said, you know, they, they teach UAV commercial pilots. By the way, uh, Canada trains 650 Canadians to um, commercial pilot standard last year, we trained 2,300 commercial UAV pilots. Just to give you a sense. And she said, you know, we're seeing a real difference in the people that we're seeing who might want to instruct commercial UAV programs. You see, many of us here, we got enamored with aviation as kids, right? And we go jump an airplane in the early days. I remember the first thing I think I flew in was a Cessna 150. I was 14 years old. And you come back and tell all these stories, and maybe then you go for beer or a pop or whatever. Um, the ones who are going out there and getting serious about these UAVs, when they finish flying, they go home and modify the software. They don't go home and talk about it. They're the whole generation of technology geeks fascinated by what's wrapped in these small packages. So, all of this is, it's really cool stuff and a whole bunch of technologies are coming together to allow this revolution to come through. So I'll just give you a little departure on this slide. I talked to a guy this morning, he's just joined, it's called the UAS Task Force of Transport Canada. He's been an AME all his life, uh, 23 years of transport. And he says, I'm coming down to this, you're dealing with this small technology. And he says, I used to be involved in certification of the 757. And I said, the 757 is really unsophisticated compared to what comes for $10,000 out of a box day in UAV. Okay? So Mavic Pro fit, fits inside. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than a cell phone. Mavic Pro. Uh, 23 microprocessors, more horsepower in there than we went to the moon with it for the whole uh, lunar lander program. So, and it's, most people here can probably afford it. Okay, where am I going with this? So, uh, I'm probably embarrassed to talk about this piece of history because many of you probably lived this, you can tell a lot more about this than I can, but I think we're, we really started to seriously get into Canada and to remotely piloted aircraft was with this Canada program on the top left. Uh, rocket assisted takeoff, uh, turbine powered, a long range reconnaissance drone. Did filming uh, on the other side of the, of, the, of the border of Germany or the Iron Curtain and came back. 
That was a massively successful program. Uh, as with many of these things, of course, Canada never bought the stuff. Uh, but the French and the Germans used that right through the Bosnian campaign. And the last system was um, um, retired in 2010. 700 systems were built, and I am told by someone off the record that Canada made enough money out of this that this became the bank account that funded the development of the RJ. So a kind of an interesting story here. This was massively successful. Um, but again, Canada didn't buy these things, but the technology was developed for defense applications. So Bombardier went on to uh, then develop the Peanut, the Sentinel. Uh, this was an incredible technology. This was just classic of the pedigree uh, of that company developing innovative technologies. Uh, the power plant in that, um, again, I'm going with a bit of hearsay. Uh, the power plant in that was originally developed by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the U.S., as the APU for the M1 Abrams tank. Uh, ran at 50,000 RPM, uh, was the size of a shoebox, delivered enough probably to drive a 747 into the air, but it cost about the same. And so that was a challenge with this, this incredibly stable counter-rotating prop platform. Every Navy in the world today would buy it, but they were ahead of their time. Uh, nobody knew what to do with these things. Incredibly stable platform. Um, somebody mentioned my bio, I started the military's whole UAV experimentation campaign, the last job I had in the military. I hired that along with a bunch of other stuff. And I can say that I was the guy who paid for the very final flight of that. Uh, I can tell you it went in from about 3,000 feet, and we found it at exactly the same GPS coordinated as we last had it at 3,000 feet. Um, terrible story. But there was tremendous innovation in there in terms of all the things that went into that. But that was really the end of anything to do with defense in Canada with regard to the production design and the manufacture of defense systems. And uh, so there's a whole gap that started to occur in our aeronautical system as a result of that. Now, 2006, Provincial Aerospace, St. John's, Newfoundland, flew the very first commercial UAV flight in Canada. That's an aerosond there. Some of you may remember it was just before that aerosond that thing on the left is pretty darn small, flew across the Atlantic. Um, and they flew because uh, their customers were now the folks putting in the Hibernia oil rigs and all of that. If you have to move an oil rig because an iceberg's coming, it's a million dollars a day in lost production. And they were now going to use these UAVs to actually um, detect icebergs and do very accurate tracking to be able to give early warning whether you'd have to move an oil rig or not. So this was really the start of things. Um, so I'm going to tell you now what happened on the regulatory side, because I don't want to talk about regulations here, because you'll all nod off, but I might beat you to it. Um, I don't know, Wayne, if you were there in Victoria in 2006. So, so what happened was is that uh, Transport Canada said, all right, you can go and do this. So they're really successful at it, but these guys being maritimers, they had some inside knowledge. And they then applied to do some nighttime missions on the Miramichi River in New Brunswick, because there was illegal salmon poaching going on. And is there illegal salmon poaching anyway? Illegal salmon fishing. And they were denied. And they never knew quite why. So anyway, there was a little bit of a start of an industry in the day. The association was full of these entrepreneurs and wide ideas. And we got in a room with transport and we said, so why are you not approving any more commercial operations? And they said, well, there's a provision in the air regulations that said if you have a special flight operating certificate, same like something you'd probably do for air shows or something, you can then uh, fly your UAV. And there's one person, all of transport, who did all of that. Her name's Karen Tarr. She lives up in Dunrobin. Uh, maybe she can come in one day and tell you stories. She was the sole voice of the entire UAV business and transport. And they said, we have only had one problem. Is the provision is there to get a special flight operation certificate, but we have no guidance to industry how you would ever write one, and we have no guidance to the regulators on how, on what we do with one if we actually received an application. 
And that was the start of the UAB Program Design Working Group that Wayne then chaired for years, is we had to then write that direction. And I'm going to show you what the result of that is of when we actually put in a process to get approvals to fly commercially um, and what the outcome of that is. Okay. So um, this is the start of some of the story of commercial development. Has anybody heard of these? Anybody here heard of these guys? Yeah. So Xenon Dragon is out in Saskatoon and uh, creates this company called Dragonfly. And this is the very first successful quad rotor uh, UAV. He, he designed that. Uh, it's on the left there. 1999, he sold 8,000 of those. And uh, I, I wish that Xenon would go out there and, and you know, champion themselves, but Canadians are so damn reluctant to go out and tell these stories of our success stories. But he was the first guy to do this. And anyway, he's got a business that's running out successfully out in Saskatoon. But, <clears throat> but this was really the first of what today is starting to be the pedigree of commercial UAVs. And I'm going to talk a lot about small UAVs, and I don't want to leave the large ones out of the system. We can talk about those, but I'm really not going to talk about those because they haven't entered the market in a big way today yet, but they're coming to Canada uh, probably sooner than later. So anyway, this is Xenon Dragon's story out of Saskatoon, and, and he has a huge pedigree of, of, these, uh, of, of this technology out there today. But he's probably the guy who could say he's, he's the father of today's commercial UAV business in Canada today. But it was really defense that got things going here. And so the real message is, is that from the early days of Canada Air, everything that was happening with the development of this technology of data links, command and control systems, payloads, uh, all of that stuff was really being driven out of defense industry. And uh, in Canada, I think it was really this phase where we went to war and we started to learn how to use this technology. And uh, I can, you've probably seen these slides or had some presentation of some of this, but if you can indulge me, I'll, I'll give you a few tidbits on a couple of things. Uh, so this was the first, I think they bought a dozen of these systems. This was just to experiment with. So this is 2004. Now, that, just to give you a story of this, this is a company called Advanced Ceramics. What's that got to do with UAVs? Well, the reality is they were actually doing really high-end ceramics on some very, you know, narrowly focused defense applications, but they had a congressman um, who was a good buddy of theirs, you see, and they used to go and barbecue, and they probably, you know, bought him a little bit of, you know, something for his re-election. And uh, the Navy in Puget Sound in Seattle wanted to go out and monitor whales because they were doing sonar testing, and there's environmental folks on their neck, and they said, oh, we can't afford to do this because we don't have airplanes and so on. And they got this contract through their congressman, like just a bunch of engineers, we can certainly figure out how to make this. So they went out, actually, this was what they made to, to go and track whales off the ranges off Puget Sound. Anyways, we ended up buying a whole bunch of these here in Canada, and, and this was the cheapest way, well, I'll tell show you the expensive way, this was the cheapest way to learn about a whole bunch of things. And the first one was that all these pilots wanted to use this thing and they wanted to land it. And they kept praying in the thing. And they finally said, would you stop trying to land this thing? We'll just let the machine do it. But it took a long way to get there. And then the airspace coordination stuff. And where can you fly this? And oh my goodness, went through all this. But this was like analog data link. It wasn't even digital and it had a a normally aspirated engine, I mean, there's all kinds of things. But in the day, we went from analog to digital data links in the period of like 24 months. And we started to fix small engine aspiration problems. And the military started to figure out how to manage airspace and all that. But it was all done on the cheap with this thing that some congressman had, had bought his way into this company to do. And this is, of course, a bunch of Canadian military guys down somewhere in the States where this was made. Well, the Special Forces, they got this Israeli technology. And uh, the Israelis 
are the world leaders in this. They were using UAVs in the Bukaw Valley, remember the Lebanon campaign, 40 years ago. They are absolutely the global expertise in defense use of this technology. But our Canadian forces use this. Very, very capable little camera in the front. And this had an interesting recovery system. Uh, it would just go into a full stall and it would pop an airbag um, and it would just then land. It was, it was very, very cool that way. Um, an awful lot of uh, Special Forces guys can owe their bacon to this thing because they get into a firefight and they launch this thing and it'll give them eyes on target. Uh, but I'll tell you a little story is that the Army also had, was just coming out of the days of Hannibal and all of this, you know, and they realized that uh, they had all this electronics in Afghanistan and if you didn't pay attention to it, um, some of the electronics you're using also jammed the data link effectively on your UAV. And there's no stories out of school. This is the Aviation Historical Society. I guess that thing's on. Maybe I shouldn't tell stories, but there happened to be an anecdote, I'll put it that way, that every time there's certain uh, aircraft came in on target were called in, in tough situations, they lost the link. And there's interference with one of our other targeting data links. So all to say is this is complexity about spectrum management that was all learned um, in these days of going to war. This you will all recognize is uh, something that shouldn't fly, but anyway, the Canadians still bought it. Very expensive way to learn. This is a French built Sodge and Spareware catapult launch. Uh, anyway, that was an incredibly expensive way to learn all of the things about what a UAV should not look like, but. Uh, but it was war, and, and uh, thank goodness the lessons were learned. We'll never buy something again that at least uh, we let the Army go without the Air Force saying, you know, that actually isn't an airworthy system. And by the way, if you put that kind of shock in through a catapult system on something that big, don't expect it to survive very long. So, and then uh, probably some things that really came on later on. This was a uh, Israeli Heron large. Uh, this is, I guess, pushing a 10-ton aircraft, 12-hour, uh, 14-hour endurance, I think. And this was actually a contract, a service done through McDonnell Detweiler on the West Coast. They went to Afghanistan, uh, flew th unbelievable numbers of hours, very sophisticated payloads. But again, Afghanistan, an awful lot of things were learned about how to manage airspace. But to go to the point about air regulations and all of those things. They're flying in Afghanistan, the busiest single runway airport in the world. I mean, bar none makes Gatwood look like, you know, middle of nowhere. They're in Kandahar, and this thing is just part of the routine takeoff and landing system as a UAV. But um, what's really neat about that is that uh, the Australian Air Force just saw the capability that was in that system, and they piggybacked onto that contract. Uh, the unfortunate story is, is when that contract ended, Canada just disposed of everything involved with it. The Australians still today are flying these systems and experimenting with them uh, in Australia using that Canadian talent. Um, and a lot of that talent, fortunately, is now out in the commercial industry. It doesn't have a home, an operational use right now in the military itself. And then finally, uh, catapult launched again off a ship, something called the In-Situ Scan Eagle. Uh, tremendous system used for several years. Again, contract to support off Africa for the, all the pirating stuff that was going on, uh, protecting the shipping there. And that was operated again by a local Ottawa contractor here for many years uh, for the Navy. Um, I don't have a video here, but this is uh, when, the, when that UAV comes in, you can see it's got, what's it got, about a six foot wingspan, maybe a little bit more than that and it comes alongside the ship and it actually captures a wire and spins around like that and gets captured on that. Tremendously sophisticated system, um, but uh, it has some limitations of robustness in heavy seas, if you will. But uh, those went on to really start cracking the question about all kinds of issues from airworthiness to airspace management to all of those things about how do you use this technology and then when the war was over, that was kind of the end of where defense was using it. But at this point now, the commercial world has started to say, we think we can use this stuff for some really interesting purposes.
excuse me, this side here. So, so here's some other stuff that's going on. Uh, I'm just going to throw this out as a bit of a thought point until I get back to a bit of a theme here. Um, Howard Lowen um, gets into autopilots for small UAVs. There was a market there, 1994. He is the world leader today. Tremendously sophisticated, tiny things um, that's driving it. So uh, they're out of Winnipeg. Um, a couple of more recent developments. Uh, fuel cell powered. Um, Ballard's got a company called Protonex, which is in the UAV fuel cell business. Uh, Energy Ore is out of Montreal. Uh, they just flew a world record. They took a quad electric powered machine that probably has an endurance of 30 minutes, and they flew for almost six hours uh, by plugging in a fuel cell. And this is dramatic. You start to get these small form factor uh, machinery. You can get fuel cell technology. Endurance becomes king, right? You can go and actually provide persistent eyes on whatever you're doing. So there's just a couple of examples. Um, this one is really cool. Um, I, I made this slide actually a few months ago. Uh, this is a vertical takeoff, transitions into horizontal flight. It's got a 100 kilometer plus range. In December, they just finished doing a pipeline survey uh, in Mexico over 100 kilometers long. But the payload on there was unbelievable. So we're talking about able to determine at millimetric levels whether there's subsidence in the soil, which suggests there's something going on with the pipe. There's electromagnetic um, detectors today, which should tell you if there's a change in soil conductivity due to leakage. This technology is just starting to be used now by the oil and gas industry to solve some of the pressing problems they got. But this is developed out of Toronto. Um, and again, they've been doing their real long-range testing uh, in Mexico was their first, uh, and we'll see more of that in Canada. Uh, here's a couple more slides. A company here in Stittsville called MMIST. I can't say their name, I missed. It sounds like I'm stuttering. Anybody heard of these guys? Yeah, they're... Uh, they're not on anybody's radar, but uh, most of the Western world special forces use their uh, UAVs. So they can, uh, these guys uh, can, like out there are in these forward operating locations in the middle of nowhere, and they get their cargo delivered by these guys uh, with a GPS parafoil UAV kind of machine. Goes in there in the middle of night, drops stuff off to a meter accuracy, and they're delivering like tons of cargo. Uh, into these uh, special forces guys now. So just what everybody is out there today doing that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's new startups. So these are folks uh, who are developing applications for the recreational user and others to be able to um, pull out their phone, uh, pull up their app and it tells them right away are they in restricted airspace, near an airfield, whatever it is, works off your mobile phone and ultimately you can coordinate with other UAVs, uh, you can coordinate with Transport Canada, those things, and these are companies are developing these software applications today uh, for both recreational and commercial users, so you can fly safely, make sure you're not breaking the rules. And uh, this is a company called Iris Automation, again, young entrepreneurs um, who are developing de detection technology, um, so you can sense other aircraft that are coming close. Detect and avoid is one of the terms that's used out there. And uh, so I'll tell you a little story. Uh, how many are pilots here? A good chunk of you, yeah. So there used to be a thing where uh, you needed to have sensors on these UAVs to be able to give equivalent performance to a pilot looking out the window. Well, the thing is that we've broken that piece now because we now know that we can use really cheap sensors that will outperform any pilot's eyeballs now. So the paradigm is shifting to where now there's discussion about maybe we should be sensors on general aviation aircraft. And I know for a fact that Air Canada guys, by 10,000 feet, they're already into their stock market analysis, right? So I don't know when the last time one of them looked out the window, but. Um, so all of that to say is this technology is now in the commercial 
world and is starting to move very quickly. And we're learning things like, wow, actually our human eye cannot see other aircraft as well as we thought, but we have very cheap technology. The kind of stuff you get on your mobile phone now, we can actually process that and be quite effective. Um, we just haven't worked through how effective we need to be to give everybody confidence that our airspace remains safe. So I just want to take a theme on something else here. Um, I was a bit tongue-in-cheek asking about, you know, do you go up and take pictures of your neighbor's yard? But there's a huge issue with privacy, right? Because the difference between a model aircraft and a recreational drone is the camera. All right? You fly your model aircraft because you want to find aircraft. The guy flies a drone because he wants to see. You see? So the camera is the big difference. So we've already gone through a lot of this discussioning globally about cameras and cell phones. And the reality is, is that people don't wake up every morning dreading to see what picture there is showing up in social media because of somebody's cell phone. But we had to go through this conversation, and as an association, we led that conversation with the privacy commissioners and Norman Patterson School of Law and Queen's University Surveillance Studies and all that to talk this through about social license. If the society is not going to accept this technology, it doesn't matter what the regulator says. It doesn't matter whether the insurance company is going to give you a good deal. It's not going to happen. The politicians eventually will take on that public dissatisfaction and, and make it impossible to operate. So we had to get that social license thing done. So I just want to give you an anecdote about how it seems that events and in this case, a Canadian event changed the discussion with the media in particular. And it has to do with Corporal Doug Green. And on the 12th of May, 2013, um, it's nighttime outside Saskatoon, and there's snow on the ground. Okay, it's still snowy. And there's a guy who goes out, and he runs off the road. And um, I don't know if that's too, too loud or... Uh, Anyway, they, they try to find this guy, uh, and, and they can't find it because the car is empty, and there's these tracks going into the snow, and, and they can't find this guy. And Doug Green shows up, and uh, he pulls a Dragonfly UAV, made in Saskatoon, this is the Saskatoon RCMP, pulls it out of the trunk, and 10 minutes later, they've not only found the guy, they've also rescued him, and they confirmed that he would have died that night out there. It became the world's first successful search and rescue with a UAV. What's that got to do with all of this? Well, I was the one fielding, and probably amongst many others, the CBC calls, whatever it was to do with the privacy issues and so forth, until Corporal Doug Green ends up on the Katie Couric show with ABC. Now, can you imagine that you're the producer for ABC, and you've got this world's first story to tell, and you, you have the most iconic police brand in the world. This isn't the Stittsville Constabulary, okay? <laughs> it isn't the Bangladeshi, you know, mounted police. It's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. You know, Stetsons and, and the whole thing. So you've got this iconic brand, and you have the quintessentially stereotypical Canada, Saskatoon. Where the hell is Saskatoon? And it's snow in May, and there's nothing out there. I mean, this is scrubland in the snow in May. And it was the perfect picture. And you know what? The media hasn't called since. <laughs> I haven't had a single call in four years dealing with this. And it's amazing how the story changes. So I just want to leave you with that. OK. Um, So, we went and got regulations after provincial aerospace couldn't get permit to fly to find poachers in the Miramichi. And last year, over 7,000 commercial flight operations certificates were authorized. So, some of these are national standing SOCs. So, these are folks who can fly anywhere in Canada, certain restrictions, multiple different kinds of equipment, multiple missions, different types of applications. So, this is huge. There's over a thousand companies in the business now in Canada. So dramatic. So 
you know, whoop, all right. And this is just a survey we did just a year and a half ago about some of the industries that are involved in this. So uh, I know this is a bit tight, I'll, I'll just run through this, and I'm going to go through a little bit of stories about specifically what's in this revolution and what's happening. So uh, surveying and mapping, straightforward, boom, I need a survey done, right? Uh, you can run around your engineer in your pickup truck or you can have them fly this thing. Agriculture, I'm going to talk a bit about that. I'm not going to talk forestry because I don't know anything about it. Oil and gas, big, big issue here. So when oil was $100 a barrel, it was cheaper for them to hire a lawyer than to use a drone. Today, not so. Very expensive to get a pipeline approved, right? So big issues there. Mining, tons going on. Environmental monitoring, lots of it. Infrastructure mapping, construction. All of the big construction companies are using this technology. They can go survey a road. It's done in an hour, far more accurate. Not in a hassle, it's like a tenth of the cost, the way things used to be done. Every film set uses this stuff. But what I'll tell you is the UAV company supporting this stuff will tell you they're the least liked guy at the cast party at the end of the filming. Why? Because they show up on the set in the city, and the entire city block is full of trailer trucks, full of film equipment. And they show up with an F-150, pulling a small trailer with all the camera gear, and they're set up to go in 45 minutes. And the producer says, how much am I paying you compared to all of this? So anyway, interesting. It's, it's, it's all over there. Uh, real estate, uh, number one problem with a house when you sell it is that something wrong with the roof. And uh, we have a great conversation with the regulator about how to do this, because the regulator doesn't want you flying closest to houses or people. And the real estate guys are saying, the home inspectors are saying, we want to fly within 15 feet of a house and we want to know what the occupants there so that they're happy with what we're doing. So, and, and it's all back and forth. There's a million, house, a million roof inspections a year that are possible doing this technology if we get the regulations right. First responders, I'm going to talk very briefly about that. I'll get stuck on the insurance industry, like State Farm and all that. A little bit of defense and security. Okay, and today we're only doing visual line of sight. So a bunch of few kilometers. In the next few months, we're going to start seriously flying beyond visual line of sight, the 100 kilometer pipeline. Okay, <clears throat> how are we doing for time here? All right. Okay, um, Constable Mark Sharp. Ontario OPP, he is the godfather of police use of UAVs in the world. And it happened, it started here in Ontario with the OPP. He's in Kenora, which was really great because he'd been in southern Ontario, his bosses would have never allowed him to do what he wanted to do. He's in Kenora, his jurisdiction runs all the way to James Bay, and every time he shows up on a scene because he's a forensic investigator, he's got to wait for some Joe Blow to charter an airplane and bring all these guys in, and he said, this is nuts. He's a model aircraft enthusiast. He starts doing his own thing. All I'm going to say today is that where we are today, we are absolutely the world leaders in this. Um, and I'll tell you, right in Toronto, in the middle heart of Toronto, uh, the Vaughan, I think it was, uh, county a couple of years ago, or uh, Vaughan municipality, uh, the municipal councillors were all up in arms about using UAVs. And they said, okay, tell you what, we have an accident on the 401. Traditionally, it takes us two hours to take the pictures from ground level, and we only get a partial picture of what's going on. We can use a UAV, we get far better data, we're up at altitude, we do that done, and instead of two hours, we can reopen the 401 in 40 minutes. And oh, by the way, it's like a million dollars a minute, the 401's closed, done deal, boom. So. World's largest user is a single police force of UAVs in the world is the RCMP. They have 230 systems. So, accident reconstruction, huge mining. I've seen a fascinating picture out of a coal mine in, in BC. Um, they're starting to use a UAV, and um, they, they got this open pit mine where a 75 ton truck is like a dot in the bottom and they detect a crack. It's, it's millimetric 
millimetric around the top, and they can't get out of surveyors because it's about 20 feet over the lip on this vertical lip of this mine. Anyway, they were able to use that technology out of a suitcase, measure the, uh, continuously monitor that crack. They took all the coal out of that pit without having any issues. But if they detect that normally, they would have to stop mining uh, because they didn't know what was going to happen. This was, you know, a huge hole with this crack going like two-thirds of the way around. Like, uh, and this is the technology that's out there. But I want to leave that message with you. We're talking about millimetric measurements, not feet, not meters, or centimeters. We're down to millimeters. Uh, bridges, dams, all of that kind of stuff that's hard to get at. How about birds' nests and cliffs? Ornithologist, pioneer for that? The guy who was the world leader figuring that out is, what's his figure his name? His name is Dr. David Bird <laughs> uh, of McGill University. He's now retired professor emeritus. And if those remember the great debate about what's going to be our national bird, the gray jay, uh, David Bird is the guy who brought that forth. Anyway, uh, David also editor of our journal. Uh, but anyway, anything vertical that's hard to get at, um, this technology has now been used. And finally, I go back to roof inspections. Um, Far more accurate, far less cost, um, and it's ubiquitous use of the technology. So let me just run you through a bit of story here. The, the flight control systems today are unbelievable. The sophistication of the software coupled to GPS and these inertial systems, you know all of our phones have got these, right, accelerometers in them. It's because of that technology, you can buy this stuff for a couple of cents. You put those now on a board. Um, and then there's a community of open source software development. Raspberry Pi, those kinds of names come to mind. Hundreds of thousands of kids are programming this avionics. And so it's unbelievably sophisticated, you know? And so this stuff is now showing up in what I'm going to talk you through a bit about to give you a sense of what this really means in terms of real making a change. So you can now fly really accurately, and you don't have to be an engineer or a pilot. You just say, I need to fly this field here, the size of the field. It already knows what the wind conditions are. It's got a little bit of meteorological sensors in your suitcase. It knows what the battery limitations are, given the temperature. And it says, here's where you can fly. And it lines up the pattern and says, OK, Buster, press go and I'm out of here. OK, so the first thing is this mission planning and all that is really sophisticated. Now, once we get beyond visual line of sight, we've got other challenges about deviations in the flight path and those things that we have to deal with. But the avionics is really sophisticated. And again, if you flew a 757, boy, that was a real antique compared to the stuff that comes out of a suitcase today. So this is a classic example of, uh, this is a Swiss company called SenseFly. Uh, this is a fixed wing drone called EB. Uh, it literally comes in a suitcase. The wings snap off, it comes in three pieces. You put it together, and it is one of the most ubiquitously used fixed wing UAVs today in the agriculture industry, certainly in Canada. Uh, this is used by agronomists uh, to do a whole lot of interesting things. I'm gonna kind of walk you through what the revolution is here. So um, this thing comes in a suitcase. You snap it together. The whole, everything is there with regard to flight planning. Of course, it knows where you are. It's got the GPS. Uh, it's got the maps and everything. You say, this is the field I want to fly. Um, altitude maybe typically, you know, might be 100 feet. Program it in. Uh, and off you go, and it feeds the data, you know, and at the end comes back to you. Um, so this is typically a sensor that it might have. Uh, this is a four-channel spectrometer, uh, and it has a calibration lens on it. Why a calibration lens? Because if you take an optical picture of a field, um, and, and you want to look at your corn crop, and uh, you fly back the next day, but it's sunny, where yesterday it was cloudy, you'll have a different spectral characteristics. So these are calibration. So one of the things that they do is they fly uh, these spectrometers are optical, they can be red, green, blue lenses, but they're also quite often uh, infrared, 
And the choice of the sensor will depend on whether the crop is just sprouting, whether you're just looking at bare earth, or whether you've got a full crop, depending on what you want to see. And out of the temperature differentials, and I'll show you something here, they have a standard model called a normalized differential vegetation indicator, where what it basically does, it shows the stress in a plant due either a lack of moisture or too much moisture or a pest or something infecting it, and the stress shows up in the thermal characteristics of in the image. So this is a typically uh, an imager that's being used here uh, on this drone. So it'll fly that. It'll probably do um, that 100 acres in about 30 minutes. So one of the things then is it measures, it shows you crop health. Um, but one of the other things, this is a really lousy slide, I'm sorry to show this, but this is a technology that Canada is a world leader and it's LIDAR. So this is a scanning laser. Uh, laser, of course, is, is accurate in terms of the, the pulse uh, size into where we're talking about nanometers here. And these things are very rapidly scanning this laser and developing 3D images. There's enormous processing required to do this. But one of the companies that does this right here is Army Geomatics. They're right. But, so this is a different type of, of scanner where you're now using laser. And I'm going to show you, uh, again, perhaps not the greatest picture, but one of the products that's being used in agriculture. And then I'm going to tell you the theme kind of how this all is working. So this here is, again, this particular picture is in hydro. And there's all kinds of issues with hydro wires. But one of the big things that they want to know over these hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of hydro wires is, is the effect uh, of, of the temperature gradient uh, of temperature on the wires. And they actually measure uh, what the sag is of the cables, uh, again, going down to very, very high resolution. But let me get back to agriculture. So you've got a, a red, green, blue, different uh, sensor technologies and LIDAR. But one of the things it produces is a map like this. Um, but what, what is not obvious here, because this is a lousy picture, is uh, this picture is, to, is the resolution is at, the, at an individual corn plant. So what happens typically in the days gone by is the farmer says, I need to spray in June for a certain pest that might invade my, my corn crop. And so they, they call in the guy with the ag plane, and he goes and sprays that thing with whatever it is. What the drone technology is doing is now what's called precision agriculture. And why is it precision? Because they used to use space data, three meter resolution, three weeks from time of order. You're now getting what I call, I do, the, I do this for simplicity of public speaking, I guess, three meters, three weeks, three centimeters, three hours. So in other words, what they're now able to do is at 8 o'clock in the morning, by 9 o'clock, they know exactly which plant is being stressed. So you don't go out there and spray the field, you actually spray the one plant. That's where the world is moving. But I want to tell you how this big picture all fits together a bit. But this is the resolution we're at now. So the, the actual um, location of, of the targets are now known to, um, to within millimeters. And that's because on the cell networks, they're running differential GPS systems on there. And so that helps to kind of... Uh... So what is happening all over Canada right now, particularly out west, is this LiDAR technology is being used first in the agricultural piece. That's the first thing you do when there's no crop out there. And they go out and measure exactly what the drainage patterns are on the farm. Now, this is an end product here. Um, and what you see is actually, if you look closely, and I wish you could, but I'm sorry for that, is the red dots are areas where water pools. And there's blue and red arrows. And they tell you which way the water is moving down into the natural water courses. And what the farmer can now do is determine how they want to manage the drainage on their land. But what's really cool about this is now the They've got to figure out how to best move some soil around to do that. That data is fed directly into a laser inclinometer on a grader blade, and they're now shaving those farm drainage ditches at resolutions of half a centimeter. 
and it's fed directly into the laser and kilometer. They're moving minimum amount of dirt, and they know exactly what's going to happen to that. And this stuff is going on all over the prairies today to manage this stuff. But it gets cooler. So uh, here's another picture of, uh, again, these are test strips. These are where they put in different types of crop, and they're able to actually go in there and measure crop performance. Um, and again, if you were to delve into this, you'd find that we're talking about resolutions of something better than uh, that. But this is the front end of the story. We've got really, really accurate data. The trick is I want to tease you a bit on what's happening with the integration of all of this. So, I know my soil chemistry because you've got soil samplers out there. I've got my drainage all sorted. I know exactly what's happening in the water, you know, da 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 da. And now I can measure exactly what's happening with my crop as it's growing. Um, but boy, this is, this is just the start of where we are today. Um, now all the data is layered together. So, what the agronomists are doing, you might not know this. But up until five years ago, farmers based their decisions on how their grandparents farmed the land and maybe what happened the last few years there was a drought. They really didn't have data. The masses of data they've got now are, are, are revolutionizing farming. And it's all about generating um, lower costs. And the costs are measured in many different ways. But it's all about layering the data, the soil, uh, biosphere, you know, what's the bacteria content? What are the main com compounds with regard to the metals, phosphorus, manganese, all of those things? And then what, how all these data layers work together so you can figure out now what to do with your farm implement uh, with regard to what it's got to do with regard to seeding and all of these things. And the revolution is that since 2006, all modern farm implements have a digital data interface. So the feed now is coming off the UAV, it's going into a data analytics facility being combined with you know, a lot of the crop data, all of the other data, and it's providing them what's called a prescription and it's being fed into an automated tractor. And don't think a modern tractor has a driver in it anymore. It's got a system monitor. You go to North Gore, you can call up Jordan and take a look at what he does on tractor control systems, and you can see a video um, the dual tires on the back of the tractor that are taking the feed of this data are running down a cornfield and the spacing between the tires is this much and the corn plants are running between those and he runs thousands of kilometers on farmland at seven kilometers an hour and doesn't touch a plant. Unbelievable. This is the revolution. So, it's, all of this is coming together right now. Uh, in, a, in a pace that's unbelievable. The future of technology is in farming, and it's attracting youth back to the fields. It's amazing what's happening out there, because they're, uh, they're using all of this really, really cool stuff. So uh, all the data's being layered together. So I better keep rolling here, right here. Right, so back to this. This is the latest, coolest gadget. Um, that is a crop sprayer. Developed by the Ukrainians, the very first one was just approved by Transport Canada. It's not public yet, but I've met the guy who's got this. This is unbelievable. This flies at 70 kilometers an hour, five meters over your field, and it dispenses whatever chemical needs to be dispensed. The, I mean, the flight controls are unbelievable, but the real magic in this is the atomizers, the spray nozzles. Some guy with a PhD in California developed those. I mean, a Nobel Prize winner kind of guy. Uh, that's the real sauce. So can you imagine, one of the first things we're now trying to figure out is Lake Erie used to got clean. You know, we had the clean air, clean lakes and all that. A couple of years ago, Lake Erie is now covered in algae because of all the nutrients coming out. This is the technology that now allows us, instead of having to run a tractor to go and find that with that sprayer, this guy can go out the zip there and zap that one corn plant that needs, you know, some pesticide or a little bit of nutrient. And that's the big change. So it's, it's really happening. And I won't tell you what the price of this is, but in the world of this technology, it's unbelievably inexpensive. But the technology is really, really sophisticated. Okay, 
So this is all happening. Um, we got a couple of test ranges in Canada now that are set up for long range beyond visual line of sight testing. And uh, just because you guys are into aviation stuff big time, a really neat place in University of Ontario Institute of Technology in Oshawa, uh, climatic wind tunnel. You see a UAV there going environmental testing. Um, that's because it's cold out here sometimes. And if, if you buy anything you know, then it's labeled made in California or designed in Arizona. Uh, you know, leave it on the shelf, right? So. Okay. I, I'm going to, I'm just going to go on to a little bit of a, where's the revolution? I know this is a historical society brief. Remember I said, let's write the history today. There's things happened in the last 24, 36 months that are totally changing the face of what's happening in aer aviation and aerospace. Okay, Internet of Things. So when you fly Air Canada, NAV Canada manages the airspace, and, and a portion of that outrageous airfare that they charge goes to NAV Canada. Um, the problem is, is the UAV industry wants nothing to do with that because it's too expensive. Remember, it's all about cost. So if you're starting at a tenth of the price, we're talking. So we'd like to actually do all of our asset management traffic management, low altitude, we'll, we'll give them that, um, with our cell phones. And we, about $40 a month is perfect, you know. Not $40 from every ticket that we pay for Air Canada. That's the revolution. So the first little bullet there is company that started to develop what's called unmanned traffic management technology a few years ago it was just bought by Verizon. Now. Rogers, Bell, TELUS, those guys don't do air traffic management, that we're really. This is where, who's going to be doing air traffic management in the future? It's going computerized because the cell phone industry will tell you that for basically no substantive cost, they manage millions of assets in real time on the network and they can do collision avoidance natively out of the box because they know where all the cell phones are, so we can actually do that. And this has got a whole lot of people's antennas up who have been charging a fortune to evolve an air traffic management system that basically hasn't changed conceptually since the 1950s. We're still doing primary radar and, you know, mode 3 and all that stuff. So, Verizon, telecom industry is involved in this. UPS, parcel delivery service. The days of the bricks and mortar. Take a look at what's happening with online shopping, that last mile delivery. UPS, Amazon are driving this industry because the amount of money to be saved on getting stuff to customers is unbelievable. And so what they do is they got this automated truck, they got these charging pods with a whole fleet of UAVs, and as they're going down the road, they just boom, 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 delivery come back, automatic, it's all loaded up, the next cargo, and they dispense it. That's so UPS got money, you know, Amazon got money, yeah. Verizon got money. Um, now, I'm going to go to another piece. Uh, everybody here has a laptop, or those of you who have a laptop, I bet you, you have a little sticker on it, and it says Intel inside. I'll also bet you that not a single one of you has a phone that has a sticker on it. Right? Intel is really, really mad about that. They totally missed the mobile phone market. They're not going to miss the Internet of Things. They're trying to get their chips into every UAV that's going to be made so it says Intel inside, because that's the figure of the future data revolution that's going on. Agriculture, mining, you name it, they want to have Intel on board. So we've got Intel, Qualcomm. All these guys with AT&T on board. So here's a cool one, a Canadian story. A company called Letter Tech uh, is a spin-off of Institut National Optique. We're a world leader in LiDAR technology. Letter Tech is one of those. And they do, they've got a LiDAR that's about half the size of my thumb. And it'll go on the bottom of a UAV and it's perfect for ground collision avoidance and that stuff. So when you come into land, it gives you precise altimetry, but gives you like a, that ground clearance function. Uh, probably the top performing technology in the world comes in at the best price. They're just, nobody can compete with them. But, 
September 7th, they get $130 million of money comes in for their LiDAR technology. It doesn't come from the UAV industry. It comes from the autonomous vehicles industry. And we're going to benefit as a result of that. So we've got cell phone technology, mobile cloud computing, Internet of Things, automated vehicles, and all of that money is fueling this UAV industry that is changing monthly as a result of this tremendous investment of money. And there we go. So who is man developing the software for the future of aviation unmanned is Uber. So how many of those folks would be in your average aviation historical presentation that you've been involved in? Well, 20 years from now, that's going to dominate this. And Boeing might be there, but I don't know. It might be in yesterday's story. Okay, I'm just going to pose with a couple of thoughts here. Um, so I'm going to give you a, just a couple of quick examples. So this is DJI. DJI is Chinese. They own almost three quarters of the world market for recreational UAVs, and they got some really neat stuff going on in professional stuff. So they are now giving software updates, you know, just like any other software update goes to your computer. But the difference is, is the software cost is being amortized over millions of recreational and commercial customers. So the latest DJI drones, you get that software update, it knows that it needs to return to you because it doesn't have battery life left. It's smart enough, it does its own pattern power management. It will turn around and it will automatically detect and maneuver into obstacles like buildings, condo towers. And that all comes in stuff that is now kind of in Best Buy. So that's the consumer end of millions of these devices amortizing the software development cost. But here's what's happening on the other end. So this is what Airbus is doing. So uh, any of you guys uh, watch what SpaceX is up to? They have a good launch today? So <laughs> Airbus is the main player in Ariane space. And they are scared to death of another SpaceX showing up and what they do. And Boeing and Lockheed already don't know what to do. I mean, they got a, you know, and they're a heck of a mess. Uh, because, you know, they used to be able to just charge $250 million for launch. That's where the price point is. And Elon is charging $90 million and still making more money than Boeing. So, so what happens is, Airbus decides they need to get disrupted. They set up a startup company, Airbus. Like, what do they got, 150, 200,000 people? They set up a startup in Silicon Valley. And last December, less than two months ago, within two years of starting that company, two years, they flew their first flights of an air taxi, autonomous air taxi. And that's it right there. Go on and take a look at Vahana. They are absolutely fearful of what happens if they don't get themselves nimble and figure out what's going on with this technology. But the thing about it is, it's a convergence of enabling technologies. These drive motors and these electric motors are unbelievably powerful. The torque capability in those, the sophistication of the control system, the control laws, and all of this consumer electronics that they can use without having to go to the Rocco clones and all that, these unbelievably expensively priced commercial avionics kind of. And the scary part is, you can't read this at the bottom here. This is the savings for a guy running a small helicopter. And you got to believe it because Eurocopter or uh, Airbus has made as many helicopters as anybody in the world. And that's a scary part. It's 70% savings. Uh, I can tell you that three years ago, I didn't think this was going to happen. Uh, but this is now the big guys are getting into the game. So last part, this just came out. This was just unwrapped a few weeks ago. 
This is the folks in Mirabelle, commercial helicopter guys of Bell, and they've been doing an in-house technology exploration effort that they just unveiled called Hydra, and they're going into the autonomous air taxi market. And they figure that's also where they're going to be. So this is now happening in Canada, and what a turn in. We had this Montreal-based evolution of Canada Air back in the 50s, the CL-289, the Peanut, the 327, all that defense technology, everything goes really quiet. You know, nothing happens on big, on big systems. And now we've got Canadian Enterprise again in Montreal. Maybe, maybe this is going to go somewhere. But this is serious players um, taking a look at serious systems. And where we're going to see the larger systems is in the remote communities of Canada. Um, the Renfrew paramedics here have already clearly demonstrated that if they can get a defibrillator to someone with a UAV, and, and they can show that they can do this uh, with a UAV, the chance of survival based on their current statistics of delivering defibrillators in Renfrew County is dramatically goes up. We are in fact going to see a rule change for first responders using UAVs because of the public risk factor um, within the next few months, specifically uh, driven by folks like the Renfrew County who are very much involved in developing this. So. So we'll see remote use, a lot of these things. I think in cities, my sense is if I was going to be smart, I wouldn't go chasing the pizza delivery guys. The first thing I'd do is I'd move uh, organs that are ready for transplant from a hospital to other very predictable tracks, that kind of stuff, social good. And the pizza delivery will come. It's just going to happen. Um, just a question of when. We'll figure out some higher value goods to move first. So back to what's happening in Canada. So uh, this is unmanned traffic management. So I'll give you a pace of this. Four years ago, nobody had heard what unmanned traffic management was. Then the Federal Aviation Administration in the state said, we don't want to deal with low-level UAVs and any of that stuff. The city of San Francisco wants to deliver stuff around the city with UAVs. You go and figure it out. We're not going to do it for you. And ICAO has said the same thing in Montreal. And that's where the the industry is really stuck because they're taking this mobile phone technology and they're going to move it in there. We're probably going to start trials in Canada um, quickly, but I'll tell you where, if nobody thinks this stuff is moving over a city, check out that thing on the bottom. That was December, Singapore. All it is is a city. They're going to implement drone delivery services throughout Singapore and they've already got the RFP for the unmanned traffic management system uh, out there. And I'm hoping some Canadian industry might be involved. So, this is going to change the way we manage air traffic. It's just the air traffic management guys haven't quite figured out when that um, is going to come upon them, but it's happening sooner than later. This is going to be all digital, all the other. So, so the challenge is we're going to start flying further and further. We're going to have to do those thousand kilometers of pipeline. And when you do that, you get masses of data. So the artificial intelligence industry is all now linked into this to figure out how to deal with these great masses of data that are being generated. Uh, guys in CARP, the Army Geomatics, just did a job out in Alberta the other day. They did a town uh, mapping with laser, this laser mapper, sort of very accurate, given town planning forecast going forward, and that is six terabytes just to map one town at high resolution. So we've got a tremendous amount of work going on with the, end, with the artificial intelligence deep learning industry to figure out how to deal with that, to get the right data out there. Um, certainly for rural Canada, we've got to fix some of the communication stuff. I think we've got some real allies with the helicopter industry in that as well, um, how we would get that moved out there. Um, you know, Rogers is really interested in selling you Netflix. There's some new big, big players that are really interested in doing industrial internet of things and maybe Rogers is not going to be your preferred service provider in the future um, when you go to restock your fridge automatically from uh, Whole Foods, you know. Uh, we got to worry about performance or reliability. There's still some work to be done. It's really hard to tell Transport Canada I want to manage my UAV in Ottawa with my cell phone because maybe the cell phone isn't as reliable as you think. 
And then the big thing is we also got to keep the recreational user safe because we've got to be able to do that um, to keep aviation safe but keep the recreational user also there. Um, fantastic, you know, attractor to from kids to adults to use. How do we do it safely? So this is the big things that are happening today. And they're right at the top there. Those are the two trends driving things at a pace that we have never seen before in our existence. So stuff we thought was impossible last year is done. Okay? It's, it's like done. And this is because Verizon, Amazon, Google, Uber, all of those players are driving this bandwagon. I'm going to connect all of this up somehow. I don't know quite how it's going to work. Um, I have trouble getting the simplest things done on my laptop, but somebody told me this is actually all working. So when do the terrorists use UAVs to d deliver their dirty bombs uh, in, into this room? Yeah. Yeah, so that's already happened. I, I mean, the, the military is certainly working that problem with ISIL. And they're using that. Uh, the Russians had a bit of a nasty scare, I think, in Syria with some as well. Yeah, and this is two-sided. Yeah. Uh, there are companies developing countermeasures technology. Uh, but I think that in this world, um, you know, defense is always going to be behind the offense. Um, the reality is, is most anybody with a grade 10 education can put a propulsion kit on with a cell phone you know, with a magnet to put her, you know. So it's here today. But equally true is there's issues going on with, uh, with the countermeasure side as well. Um, part of the countermeasure challenge is who's going to pay for it. So in aviation speak, there's a classic issue of who should provide safety around airports. NAV Canada, the airport owner, transport. There are some technical things that can be done. We're trying to figure out how they can actually be done. And so geofencing is an example. Um, all of the stuff that DJI produces today, internally that map says if you're controlled airspace, it actually won't start. You know, you cannot physically get the blades to turn uh, unless you've got some special dispensation or there's a way to do that. So I think there's going to be those kinds of measures that will come with software. The Europeans have just come up with a standard for that geofencing. Um, so there are, there are challenges out there. So, so two subjects here. So one is the actual integrity of the design, the manufacturer, and the operation of the equipment itself. And, and that very much is a conversation that's alive and well with the regulator trying to figure out how to do that. And, and simply is because, you know, when all the big thinkers got together in Chicago after the Second World War and signed the Chicago Convention on ICAO, they said, if you're going to fly, you know, it's got to be airworthy. And then they left it up there to figure out what airworthy is, and that's what we're struggling with. How do we write airworthiness into something, you know, that's, that's manageable and enforceable? Um, with regard to the unmanned traffic management system, what the FAA said is they're also the air navigation service provider, and they said we are not going to, um, you know, manage the low-level airspace. So that is going to be managed. There are absolutely going to be rules of behavior around that, all I'm saying is it's going to be completely different from traditional airspace management that we see in controlled airspace. It's going to be computer managed. It's going to have its set of rules. There will be an interface protocol and standard between the low level unmanned traffic management and, and the controlled airspace or the air traffic management world. So that will absolutely uh, be put to rigorous test. But I will submit to you, it will be more robust, far more powerful than the current air traffic management system. The, the current ATM system is just dying from being unable to move. It's, so what's, what's going to change is, is there was a time when you, you had your name go in with your aircraft registration, and there was a view that that would be done with UAVs. And, that, and that's clearly not what we're going to be doing now. We're going to now electronically register. And, and this, so you not only identify what the asset is, but everything about it, but you're also going to be managing the flight plan in real time, the actual flight evolution. Um, so there's a scenario there that if your cell phone coverage, let's say, in an urban area, your phone cannot work as a phone unless you have a cell phone subscription and you're logged into the network. 
And, and so that may be very well how uh, we're going to deal with UAVs. You're in a, a wireless coverage area, um, on that, unless you, and as soon as you log in, everything about that device, its ownership and all that is known. It's broadcast all the other traffic in the area and it's managed that way. So I think that's, that's what's happening right now. There it is. Uh, that's the future. We run a, a student UAV competition. Uh, we have 14 universities this year. We run a real world scenario. This is um, world class. Um, the Americans run one internationally. They invite 150 universities. They down select the 40. And twice in the last nine years that we run our competition, the winner of the entire global event, they're going up against Stanford, you know, the top three times, the winner's been Canadian, one of our teams. Okay, so th this is absolutely the best and the brightest. And uh, so it's, it's brilliant. This year's a law enforcement scenario. Um, so it's, it's, we, we change the, uh, the complexity of it every year. Um, and uh, so they're using machine learning, all that. And, and they, uh, they, we give that as a commercial proposition. They have to present a technical design. I think the technical design is due when, Sue? End of the month. End of the month. 14 teams, the average 14 to 16. There's total about 400 university students that are comprised these teams. And then uh, the first day they show up, they have to do a presentation with their customer, their project management, their system engineering, all of that. Uh, they're given 15 minutes or so to do that. That's peer reviewed by all the other students, all that. And then uh, they actually go and fly the mission. And a certain time after they've flown, they have to produce a report. And we ask, you know, skill testing questions like that gravel pit over there, you know, how much gravel is in it. And, you know, all kinds of things like that. And so uh, this year's a law enforcement scenario, um, actually aided by some really knowledgeable people in the police world. And the difference this year is going to be the scenario is going to be dynamic. We usually give them a static thing, go out and tell us how many crop fields were out there or whatever it happened to be. Some of them have got nothing to do with UEs. Just in aerospace, they hire these guys. Anyway, sorry. No, that's great. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And that's everything. Thank you. All right.